if you have slides to sh share, Chris, you can add them whenever you feel like it. I'll do a little intro for you at the top of the hour. Okay, yeah, I don't have slides. I, I will be sharing my screen. Uh, this okay. is usually a pretty informal gathering, so that's kind of driven by with the needs of the, the group. group. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. No problem. Hey, Chris, who's your friend in the background there? <laughs> well, I have two friends. Uh, the white dog is Max and the black dog is Kiwi. And they just had baths, so they're very keyed up. And uh, they want to go outside, but I'm not willing to let them yet. So they, they, may, they may cause uh, extra entertainment. <laughs> it's been advantageous. It's also been super distracting. So it, it just depends on what the situation is. Well, they're very visually entertaining. They don't really interrupt the flow. <laughs> so <laughs> you can just watch the action. Yeah. It's pinned under. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll get into little, yeah, there they go. They're going at each other. So yeah. have a little dog fight behind me. A little wrestling match. Yeah. How you doing, Chris? Good, Blake. What's up? Nice to see your face. Yeah, you're the same. It's been a really good conference, like I gotta say. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it doesn't beat in person, but it's it's doing what it needs to do. Yep. It's um, just hanging out in IRC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been challenging myself with trying to watch both tracks at the same time. <clears throat> so I've got, <laughs> I've got a VM in my own machine and uh, both of them going and I'm muting and I'm muting back and forth to, uh, uh, to kind of track both of them. I'm glad that they're being recorded, which we don't yeah. get. We don't get that. Um, you know, we do in person. We get the slides most of the time, but we don't get the accompanied uh, verbal. Uh, I was going to, that's a great point, Blake. I was going to mention just to everyone that in the future, I think we should video all the conference sessions. Yeah, we, we, we went through a period where that was pretty standard. Right. Um, I mean, at least with the sessions, they probably wouldn't have recorded this admin group. But I mean, like, you know, an actual prepared presentation. They, they, they went to that, like, so. Specifically, I mean, the Mike and Galen's presentation on the Perl, you know, the open surf development and the action triggers, I, I plan to just use as resources to go, you know. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Talking about that in another one right. of the sessions, and they were talking about the potential expense of it. And also that sometimes, depending on what the venue is, you have to use their um, team. But you know, I, I I agree that it's such a useful thing to be able to go back and refer to these. It's one thing to see the slides, but to actual, you know, hear everything afterward is great. Yeah, I was it, wondering. It, it is expensive. I was wondering if there's a way that we could um, set up a Zoom session and just have it recorded. Nobody attend in Zoom. Mm -hmm. but just have Zoom record it in some way. It, the only thing I could think about is miking might be an issue. Um, but... we, we did that at the Hackaway and that was the issue, was, yeah. was uh, being able to hear everyone who was talking. And even when we had a mic that was being passed around, um, it, it's not like a PA mic where you can really hear how loud your voice is. So people didn't really know how close to hold the mic. And, <laughs> You know, it, it was that that was definitely an issue if we had multi directional microphones somehow that would pick it all up. But then you're talking about, you know, multiplying that by the number of people in the room and then multiplying that by the number of sessions you're trying to run currently and then having to move it from room to room. And, you know. yeah. and the Internet connection has to be rock solid. My and, idea and, was good, man. Start. Stop throwing facts at it. 
<laughs> no, it, it, it is, and it's better than nothing. And and I think even the people like you know I don't know Jason Stevenson didn't make it in person to the uh, hack away, so he might have comments. But I, I think it was better than not being able to do anything. You know, it was, yeah. it was maybe one step above not being there at all. I actually just reviewed our uh, Hackaway recording on YouTube uh, yeah. last night after the conference. Um, and that was nice. That was nice um, to have that. Um, I had the same thought as Adam, like the, we might, or actually I think April was just saying, why don't we just keep using Zoom and doing it in person and then nobody actually attend online, just attend in, the person, in person and let Zoom do Zoom and we do us in the room. Right. Um, yeah, uh, and I don't know that you necessarily need to record the crowd, although like right now we're having like a, an interaction that would be handy to have recorded. Um, right. But we're just we're just talking about getting the speaker and the accompanied slides and, and the timing of what they're saying with the slide that they're on. Um, if we just had that, I think we would be like 90%. <laughs> it no, might I, be a lot of of overhead but you know like have people do their presentations in person and then schedule a time like the next week to capture that same presentation i mean it would mean them doing it twice but they would get the you know the nerves and the experience of doing it in person and then be able to just do it by themselves to a computer you know and record that the next week or something and then we capture that <laughs> say flip it do yeah. like the week before do the presentation online and record it and then that way you get oh. all the nerves of the presentation out and you get all the bugs worked out of your presentation after the practice session <laughs> and then Hi. post it post it online before you do the one in person so everybody can review your recording first and then go go and then critique time. your in-person session <laughs> yeah. well you get all those questions that you um the people don't think the, the you, you get questions at that point because I know a lot of times when I'm attending a session, there's lots of things I don't know or I don't think about until later to ask. Because yeah. I know the Hackaway next year will be, we'll do the same thing as we did last year. Because it will be hosted again by Evergreen Indiana. Well, I, I know this may not be necessary since, you know, we're, we're, everybody's already chatting, but um, <laughs> it's approaching four, so I'll, I'll do the little, our little blurb um, just to cover our bases here. <laughs> Waiting for it to tick over. The, the last, oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> this track is sponsored by NC Cardinal with live captioning made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative, and we'd like to thank our captioner. We'd also like to thank the other conference sponsors for making this event possible, Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. Uh, we'd like to encourage everyone to chat freely. <laughs> I've changed the text a little. Um, we'd like to introduce Chris Sharp from Georgia Pines, who will be leading this session of the SysAdmin Interest Group. Thank you very much, April. Um, this, uh, if you've not participated in this before, uh, this group traditionally has been, has happened at each conference since I think 2010 maybe. Um, and it is, it has traditionally been a fairly informal attendee driven discussion about topics of, of interest involving Evergreen System Administration. Um, it, has uh you know when we're in person we've actually broken off into side groups that's not really possible under this uh particular zoom situation in the same way it would be if we were physically together um but uh so we we and we typically have uh, a note taker who has you know done this in like a shared google document uh that that could be me or that could be someone else who volunteers um but basically giving us some notes that we can then, you know, gives people not just the recorded record here, but like an actual document that you can, uh, can, can do that. So 
Uh, we have a question, are we in presentation mode? And I, I don't know exactly what that is. I think we're in meeting mode. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is meeting mode, at, which is why you're able to turn your own you know, cameras turn, yeah, on. turn on video and, and, uh, and audio. Um, I think the I question might be coming because with the desktop shared, you can only see four people at a time, roughly, as opposed oh, to the see. image grid. Maybe April, if you stop sharing your screen or your the image. Well, actually, I can see. You, you can. Well, it depends on the screen size, but. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, and you, you can also click a uh, yeah gallery view versus speaker view in the upper right. That'll give you more more faces. Um, so yeah, now now we're in Brady Bunch mode. If you click. Uh, gallery view yeah um so it, and i'm just depending on how many people are in the room you can you can switch between screens uh to see everyone um so anyway well <clears throat> so as i mentioned this has been uh kind of an agenda less meeting uh but i do have uh some ideas of what we can do if no one has a particular uh, option, like a particular topic that they want to delve into or, or questions that they've, they've always wondered. Um, we, even though there are lots of um, experienced sysadmins in the room, we, we do encourage newer people to ask their questions uh, that they have concerns about uh, so, that they, so that we can assist. Because a lot of us have been doing this for many years. I, I started at uh, GPLS in 2008 and have been doing this work since then. So, and, and several of us have had, you know, similar career arcs. And so, um, you know, we're, we're open to questions. Um, we can um, do that. But if there are no questions, I had the idea that we might just sort of do a guided tour not of an ins not of the install process which somebody might appreciate but of the maybe a running evergreen system to sort of know what the different moving parts are and how you might take a look at those parts and, and know what to administer what what it actually means to be a system administrator um and that that idea came to mind as something that you know, people could benefit from and, uh, and do but uh if there are uh, questions about how we're administering you know, hardware, virtual environments, uh, containers, uh, cloud hosting, that kind of stuff. That's that's all stuff we've talked about in the past. Um, so I I will open the floor, and um, you know you can use the chat feature or you can speak up with your microphone, and we'll see what we can do. I'll start. Has anyone done any tinkering at all with uh, Kubernetes as it relates to Evergreen? You have it, Blake? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually planning on this year or very soon um, forking all of the open ILS services into their own containers and having Swarm deal with the load and introducing more containers for each service. Excellent. Oh, because I've seen, uh, I mean, I, I've you your documentation reference in uh docker on your repo i've used that in the past so one thanks for putting that up there it was helpful for you know sort of i've gotten beyond you know new novice in docker but not much farther than that still um and chris and i and the gpls pines people we we have continuing conversations about you know really more Ansible playbook jazz than containerization, but it's all like under the same umbrella. So I'd be curious to see if, you know, if you share that, what, what it looks like. So thanks. Yeah, I'm excited about the idea of using more um, Kubernetes uh, native gusto rather than um, one container per VM, so to speak. Well, right now, right Right now, you, you do your, you know, you, if you take the branch I've got out there that, or look at the repo and, and uh, tell it to go, it'll, it'll create a Docker container that runs Evergreen, you know, 
and that's it. It installs Postgres and it does all the mail, hooks up all the cron. It does a lot of stuff, no doubt about it. But it's all encompass. It's all in one container. Right. Um, so the next step that I'm really hoping to get to um, is to divide each little piece up and deal with Open ILS routing. Might even have to edit uh, some of the source for Open ILS to be. Uh, <laughs> what's up, Bill? Uh, I don't know why it's upside down. Oh, uh, I, I think I do know. It matches your background. <laughs> so I, I don't know if Open ILS is from Spain. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, talked over you there. Nice. Well, anyway, I don't. I don't I'm not sure. I don't think I have to edit. Um, open surf. Sorry, open surf is what I was talking about. I don't think I have to add open surf in order for it to work in um, split services. I think it's a matter of DNS. I think the um, the uh, open surf XML can just refer to a DNS name for all the different um, pieces, and then the router uh, would look it up at, at the Kubernetes level. And then you know maybe we have to have a special DNS server running in the swarm. I haven't exactly fleshed out all that stuff, but something I've been thinking about. And to a step backwards for the benefit of people who don't know what Kubernetes is in the first place and that might feel like, oh gosh, this isn't the session for me. Uh, Kubernetes is a, a, a soft, software application that will allow you to uh, sort of herd all of your servers in a coordinated way. And um, that that's sort of the high level explanation of what that is. And it sounds like Blake has actually done it and Adam is curious. So um, that that's <laughs> that's where we are. I just didn't want people to get lost too far yeah, in the weeds right. uh, about uh, what that is. So I, I will add that we actually are using Kubernetes on the cloud, Google Cloud's um, framework infrastructure. And it does work with the container we fed it. And Evergreen is automatically being load balanced and healed and health checked by the Kubernetes engine. So we are doing that. Okay. All right. Following up on that, like, does that make it more reliable? Do you think? I mean, have you really have you really seen a benefit over this versus like uh, running it on monolithic servers or virtual machines in the past? Definitely more reliable. We uh, we didn't use Kubernetes to begin with, and I remember those days and uh, troubleshooting which app server is the one and um, all that stuff. If you have your health checks all perfect, Kubernetes will find the bad one, kill it, and make a new one from your container, thereby resolving whatever before anybody even knows, before we even know half the time. Um, so it, it's self-healing, um, and that increases reliability for sure. Okay, and from the chat, um, Jane mentioned that she's been using Docker Compose with other projects and says that that's good for setting up dev instances easily. Yeah. Yeah, I'm lagging a little behind on up, updating our Docker Hub image, but um, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, this discussion, of course, reminds me, oh man, I haven't published 3.3 uh, .3 or 3.4.2 or whatever, <laughs> the version that you might be wanting to test with. Uh, so you could just type in, you know, Docker run, you know, Mobius office colon, you know, or whatever, slash, uh, you know, uh, each version number you want, and then it'll just magically poof a uh, next server into existence. It's getting a lot of pulls these days, been around a couple of years, seems like we've got over a thousand downloads off of Docker Hub, so it, people are using it. Right, so uh, to avoid the shame of that, like, um, <laughs> I'm going to just put that in the notes here. Let's see. Blake will be updating. Shame. Docker, Docker Hub image. Oh, free. Have, 
have you have you actually um, found yourself needing something that I lacked putting on the? No, Dr. not Hook? me personally. I, 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 um, I just you know that's the kind of thing we've always had somebody who has taken on like a installation script or you know Dan Scott a while back had you know a VMware image or a, a virtual box image I guess it was. Uh, that he kept up to date for a while and then that started lagging behind. And it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's a mouth to feed and we don't always get to it. And, you know, and we, we actually, we were providing uh, NGPLS, uh, Emerald guys and I were providing um, Debian packages as well. So that, that's, you know, and that, that project is kind of, I mean, we use devs internally, but we're not, we're no longer sort of putting them out there because we, we didn't see a lot of interest or use uh, from the community. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same here, too. I had, you know, Thomas Berzanski and I had a bunch of scripts. We could just build virtual machines from start to finish. But uh, as Chris mentioned, it's, it's another thing to feed, and then there's not much interest anywhere else. And so, you know. Yeah. Looking what, at what I've, Good. what I've actually been doing lately is using virtual machines. I'll build uh, three models, basically, one for like a we use bricks. So each brick will be a virtual machine host that will run three or four virtual machines on it. And I'll make uh, three models, like one for a SIP server, one for the brick head, and then one for brick drones. And then I just clone them where I need them and edit the IP addresses and that sort of thing. So then everything's identical. That's what I've been doing. I just reacquainted myself with where we are on those containers. Three, four, one. That's not too bad. I mean, that's that's definitely what then <laughs> what people are running. So yeah. I want to hear from people who haven't spoken up yet. Uh, are there are there things that you um, you're curious about? Don't understand quite yet. Get some guidance on. Else having a lot of fun with bots scraping stuff while ignoring the usual means of turning them away. You mean like a robots.txt file or something? Yeah, bots ignoring robots.txt and so on. I just I use IP tables and drop. <laughs> I mean that's. That's one approach is just, you know, kill their IP um, if they're if they don't respect uh, robots.txt. I was going to I've always understood that to be kind of an honor system, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, e even even the annoying bots typically honor it from what I know. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, malicious are totally going to disregard or an actual legit company that behaves maliciously by ignoring them. Um, I just, I finally resorted to that with one of them. Just so you're blocking start. Google? <laughs> <laughs> no, not Google. Um, uh, it's a Turnitin bot. And I finally just firewall ban hammered them. That, that was a sli snide soapbox comment. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, And we do, on, on the topic of robots.txt, sorry, Jason, I, I think I talked over you, but um, on, on the topic of robots.txt, there are several um, examples on community servers, you can just go to the web route and look at it, uh, of kind of, uh, in some cases, pretty elaborate setups where they allow certain directories and not other directories. Yeah, ours are pretty much no robots just just stop stay away right? yeah um and then things like directives in uh nginx to if if the string matches a certain um forget the name basically user agent user agent yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> just to turn them away eh, sometimes that 
doesn't seem to do the trick either. So it's okay. IP tables, you're done. Be nice to automate that a little better. Uh, mess with fail to ban and things like that. But we, we've used fail to ban not on our evergreen servers, but on other uh, like web web application servers, those sorts of things. Um, non non pines, non evergreen things. Jason, were you going to say something? I was going to mention you could block them by user agent if they don't listen oh. to the robots.txt. And I think. Some of them are using an extremely pedantic, very specific way to parse the robots.txt, which normal people may or may not bother to write. So they think that they are not being bad actors, just extremely picky. Ignoring star is pretty blatant. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but if you added space where they thought you should have a tab, that's enough for some of them. Yeah, that sort of thing. And SQL injection attempts are seeming to be rather rampant, um, most ignorable, but occasionally they bog stuff down. Anybody else out there? We've got a bunch of uh, quiet people who may have already switched to happy hour mode or <laughs> or are asleep at their desks because they've well, been sitting at Zoom stations for uh, days on end. Well, to follow up on Jeremiah's comment about SQL injection attempts, what I often see looks like stuff for Microsoft SQL Server. And then it's like loads and loads of parentheses, and they get entered in the search box, which in the past would cause a search to just run forever. I think there's also an old LP bug about that, and it's been improved over the years. But I remember seeing that quite a bit. We had this one morning one this morning that just caused headaches until I got them banned and while I missed half of the presentations I wanted to actually pay attention to stuck in another window dealing with crap basically all right um I've got a question. Yes. Um, how do you end up identifying like long running queries um, to the database? Like I've had a lot of auditor queries long running mm -hmm. that end up actually crashing the database because it runs out of memory. Um, right. And I've, uh, I've upped that and set some limits to it, but sometimes they just uh, end up catching air and not <laughs> seemingly so it, doing anything. And th those are just sitting there, they're idle sessions, and the last thing that was requested was select auditor or whatever it is. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Just keep, they're holding, holding the connection open. We, we've seen the same thing. Um, I don't know why they don't sort of release the connection and send it back to the pool, or if that's intentional to have, have OpenSurf uh, be efficient and not open database connections that it's going to need to open anyway. Um, sort of, I don't know, Bill, do you have any ideas about that? I'm just throwing this at you uh, blindly. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm uh, like a lot of us doing two things at once here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the question is about identifying long running queries. Yeah. Well, in particular, Chris was mentioning the, um, that there's some that are sitting there idle and the last thing uh, they have done is an auditor query, like reset auditor, I forgot exactly what the terminology is. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Um, well, uh, I mean, one thing uh, we do is we, you know, we monitor for idle transactions on Postgres and then if they're 
idle for a certain amount of time, we'll go in there and kill, manually kill the transactions if we have to. Um, I'm not quite sure how to prevent those, though. I don't know what the cause of those are. I just want to clarify. You're talking about idle in transaction, right? Not just plain idle. Yeah, I was. Well, okay. there there's some that are idle and some that are idle in transaction. Oh, okay. Because I've not really seen too big of an issue with idle by itself. Well, we, we get long-running queries that are active. And we have... Um, NRP, uh, we use not, we still use, we use not geo, so we use NRPE, and we have a script, I'll have to dig it up, that can basically just, you know, every time not just connects NRPE, it says, hey, give, give me all the running queries, and it checks how long they've been running, if it's been running over so many hours, I get an email, and then I go in and see what it's doing, um, and most of the time, I end up, I end up running PG cancel back end or PG cancel PID, whatever it is, on the back end process and just killing it. Because uh, a lot of times these end up being searches uh, that are just running, that for some reason are just never ending. Um, there's not as many of those as there used to be, though. I have to say, when we were on 2.12 and 3.0, that we got a lot more of those than we do now. And I actually got a sequel from Jason Boyer, I think it was. To, ident to pull out like the IDs and how long queries have been running and what they're actually doing. Like the first uh, 100 or so um, characters of the SQL that they're running. And I can, we, you know, I can put that up later if anyone's interested. I may It may even already be on my paste bin somewhere too, come to think of it. So I think everybody is doing something like what I'm posting in chat. Uh, and it, it's it's exactly the same issue everywhere, which points to you know something. I don't know if it's Postgres optimization issue or if it's something in the way that we're formulating the queries that uh, just means it's never going to come back. But I, I think all of us see that. And Chris Burton, and in, in, in our case, this. This is the thing that makes our database start slowing and then eventually, you know, stop receiving new connections is if we don't have something like this running to kill off the, um, the bad bib searches, uh, it, they do pile up and it becomes a, an issue. Yeah, because sometimes I get some of those bad bib searches that just sit there for a long while. Okay. Yeah. My favorite's the, the staff person that goes into patron search and basically puts something in that ends up being select star from actor user. Yep. That one's never going to finish either, as far as like uh, Evergreen's concerned. I suspect that's um. I mean, that could be one of those auto-generated interfaces where it's trying to render a select dropdown of all the users. I don't know if there's a way from the staff interface to force a give me everyone. Um, could be wrong though. It well, does limit I, though. I, it, you're and, and and to be to be fair too, I'm not. I'm just based going based on what I see in the database on the query string. I'm not actually like looking through the logs to see if I can find the actual uh, open ILS call. Although I think I did once a few months ago. I think I found one, and I was That's able to say, before. "Oh, it was, it was someone at this library who." basically did something that's happened before there's been a launchpad ticket where uh, an auto generated interface was rendering a table and it had a link on the table to users um, and uh, so it was like oh you want a list of all the users so you can pick the user so we just say like, give me the whole table um, and that's at least in one instance it's been fixed and there's other bugs open that have to do with you know preventing that generally for tables that are assumed to be larger than X but that's still uh, that's still floating out there. Yeah, there, there's there's one on the carousel uh, admin interface that, that does that where it will it'll start it links to something I've forgotten it was like every org setting or every user setting or something like that. It was like digging deep and just returning thousands and thousands and thousands of rows before it loaded the interface. So I think that's not been fixed yet. 
but anyway. And the I think other the thing book it goes. Go ahead. Oh well, the other thing that goes along with this is almost never one. Because the if it's a case of something that a staff person is doing, and and I'm not blaming staff here, they it's the not it's a bug in the software, but they will try it and it will not come back and they will try it again. And very often you'll go in, I'll go in and see there'll be three or four of these running um, more or less simultaneously because the uh, first one hasn't come back yet. So you'll, you'll see that sometimes too. We've got, there are some guards in the code for that, but I think it only works if one of them is actually returned yet. And Bill or, I don't, I don't think Mike's around, but I think Mike wrote it. So Mike could probably correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, I think that's how it works. Is like if the first one comes back, then the others don't run. Um, and it's not just caching either. There's something else going on there too. I think that was specific to searching, maybe. Uh, maybe. The case where, you know, the enter was getting tapped a bunch of times in a catalog yeah. search, and so this exact same search would come through. I don't know if that applies uh, to other things or not. Um. Yeah, I, I have a query that I put in that paste bin there on chat that logs same searches. I'm trying, I was trying to get to that, like finding somebody who held down the enter key <laughs> and generated like a billion queries on the database. Um, that, that little snippet seems to work. And then I would monitor that output with our monitoring or Zabbix monitoring, and then I'd get an alarm saying somebody's holding down the inner key, you know, that kind of thing. Don't forget the toddlers on the public PCs. No <laughs> doubt. Or the book that somebody dropped on the inner key. Yes. <laughs> we, we, one of our clients shut down their whole system because a librarian put a book down. She was on the, the right screen or wrong screen and put the book down on the keyboard. And it just hammered their database. So that that's happened to us. Yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> Brings down Georgia Pines. <laughs> this it wasn't was, Pines. It was, it was but, crazy. And it was like upgrade day. Like so it was like go right. live on upgrade day and um they uh some kid or somebody in the children's section. We were able to thankful thankfully for the way they named their their uh workstations, we were able to figure out which one it was. But uh, yeah, I was just sitting there, you know, I think it was hitting F5 or something. It was like landing on F5 and was just went F5, 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 just look, reload, 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 reload. And it was basically a, a, a DOS. So anyway. I just put the book on the table and the whole server crashed. <laughs> yeah, I think SC Lens had that happen to us one time where someone had laid the book down on their keyboard and <laughs> shut the whole system down. So this is a this is a you common. You don't need hacking skills, guys. You don't. So much for you can't break it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. We were always telling people, you know, oh, you know, don't worry about what you do. But yeah, no, don't don't tell the hackers that uh, they can just you know put their cat on the <laughs> keyboard. And... You can do anything. Just don't put your book on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Protect the keyboard at all cost. Right. Well, I think that's effectively what I'm talking about with the SQL guys is oh, nothing happens to Evergreen except for, you know, loaded down trying to uh, go, what is this? You know, DOS. Yeah. There should be ways to address some of this in Nginx too. Um, because one, one of the conclusions I came to years ago was, well, some of these things could be resolved with a proxy server. Um, but the issue there may be if you're using a load balancer in front of everything, then you would want the proxy actually on the load. You'd, you'd want a load balancing proxy that could filter out some of those duplicate requests. I, I've seen example configs uh, for some of that stuff for Nginx online. so. It's something definitely worth looking into, I think. They put us, uh, 
as the last session of the day after a adventure of uh, Perl, using Perl in the database, and developer update, and a Perl tour, and just you know the four o'clock witching hour that I think all of us hit. So it's it's okay that we're low energy, but I, but I do want anyone who hasn't spoken yet to feel free to bring up any questions they have or issues or share stories or um, something like that. So, you know, because we're, we're here to learn learn with each other and I, I'm not trying to badger anybody. I just really want to encourage participation. Oh, I have a question about catalog search speed. Does everybody feel like theirs is slow? Yes. Yes. Come on, Bill. High five to the. That's this nice. is uh, Sometimes yes. <laughs> this is where this is where we uh, we would uh, do a big old high five and talk about the hack away or something. Like that. Elasticsearch. Yeah. At the hack away, I talked about it. Um, and Bill, Bill kind of like secretly backed me up, but I was like, <laughs> "Don't tell anybody," but. Me too. Or something. I didn't say that. <laughs> hey, I've been whispering about it for years, but I haven't actually done anything with it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, what Jeff Godin has was some, was it Elasticsearch or was it something else that he was using? What is it? It's Elasticsearch, and then Bill made a branch um, expanding on that, um, but wrote it in um, Perl instead of Python and integrated into a branch in Evergreen. And as far as I know, are you running in production? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, in fact, it just deployed it on our testing cluster about two weeks ago. Um, so because I only integrated it with the Angular staff catalog, I, it couldn't, I can't get it going until we've worked out all the issues with that. So that's, uh, uh, we're, we're just now starting to do that with uh, yeah. the I Right, and I, I still plan on uh, um, putting that into the public side, um, which, you know, we'll see. I, I've got your branch running and I've got Elasticsearch running and it's really, really looking promising. Um, I was thinking that maybe like a tiny little bit at a time, like uh, uh, it could be very granular on the sysadmin side to just enable Elasticsearch for certain kinds of searches. I was thinking along the lines like if it was a keyword search for consortium, fork over and use Elasticsearch, you know, as a starting place and then um, maybe opening it up, throttling it open for more and more types of searches as we go on. Yeah, um, you might get slightly different behavior. Um, so, I mean, for example, not everything, not every feature is implemented on the Elasticsearch side. So the search might return different results depending on what, you know, checkboxes and toggles are, are activated. Um, and, and as a heads up on that, uh, I, uh, I ended up moving, or not moving, but cloning my branch over to GitHub and uh, continued work there and I've made a ton of changes. So um, the, the branch you're working from is still works great, uh, but I wanted to make it so the, um, indexing was more uh, segregated from Evergreen um, so that I could do uh, re-ingest, you know, pretty quickly. Um, I have the, uh, so a little, a little over a million bibs in about two and a half hours is sort of fully re-indexed uh, on the Elasticsearch side, whereas, a, you know, a, an actual full database re-index would take significantly longer than that. I wanted to be able to cycle through it really quickly. And it, the code being on GitHub somehow makes that faster? No, no, no. I, all, yeah, man, GitHub's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I made a ton of changes. And uh, so I, I'll, I'll point you to it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it, it, part of the reason I didn't leave that in the main one is just because it does depart from, it, it creates a much more significant departure from the, uh, uh, the way it's working now and in creating a, sec a separate indexing process. So um, I, I, it seemed like a little bit harder of a sell, uh, but uh, I would definitely love, you know, eyes on it, so. So it's something entirely separate from the Postgres full text search? No, oh yes, yes. The, um, the data indexing itself, 
uh, happens in Elasticsearch. And the data that gets pushed to Elasticsearch is um, extracted separately from the configuration that Evergreen has for extracting search indexes. Um, yeah, so it's like a whole, it's a, it's a different thing that it's doing. It's using XSLT like Evergreen does. So there, it's, it has a familiar feel to it, uh, but it's basically just one style sheet. So it's just one style sheet, record, 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 um, which is nice and fast. So uh, does the data uh, update, does that happen at regular intervals during the day or is it sort of updating live or what? So the, the, in, the indexing script has a mode that it can run in that says only update records that have been modified since X time. Uh, I'm gonna start out running it every five minutes and it'll look for Bib call number copy changes. I think it's all it's looking at right now. That's cool. See, I, I've I've thought about implementing something like this, but I've just never gotten to it. And I I just I I've always had the excuse that I didn't want another mouth to feed. But you know that that is a consistent complaint from our patrons. That's that's usually a lower score that we get on our. Um, patron satisfaction surveys and things like that we, we put out. Um, and, you know, I think it actually, that issue has made the difference in at least one evergreen evaluation or like, you know, should we move to Pines evaluation that we've seen from, from libraries in Georgia, which is concerning because it's like, you know, this is something that can be mitigated or, or fixed, but they don't go any further than that. They just see what it looks like right now. We've heard yeah. that too. Yeah, the people look at that and say, this isn't good enough when they have other options. Right. The, I mean, Chris, just a personal comment there, you know, as a member, well, you're a member of Gwinnett, or you know, you're in DeKalb, aren't you? DeKalb, yeah. Um, I mean, Gwinnett's on Cersei Dynex, and it's it's not any faster than Pines. I mean, I use it all the time, and it's. I I, I think that in a lot of cases they. In Georgia, anyway, they have reasons why they would not want to go into Pines that don't have anything to do with anything else except just I don't want to do that. So right. I think this might be like finding reasons not to. So, but it is like. If we remove that obstacle, it, that that excuse can't really be used anymore. I guess that's that's that would be something I'd want to consider. I'll so, put a yeah, link. That's to, exciting. I'd love to take a look at what you've done, Bill. I'll put a link to it in the in there. Um, and if I, I don't know when we're going to be able to move it to production, uh, just because there's so much going on, my plan is to do it later this year. But regardless, I'll I'll do a, a session on it whenever it's, you know whenever we're through the initial rollout. Fantastic. So not to take, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, not to take away from Elasticsearch or any of that, but I've been experimenting with more recent versions of Postgres. So I've got a server with 9, 6, 10, 11, and 12 installed. I see huge speed increases with 11 and 12. Um, 12 is actually sometimes so much faster than 9.6, I can't believe it's actually doing the work. Um, something that took uh, several minutes on 9.6 finishes in a matter of seconds on 12. Oh, wow. I, I, I haven't really stuff. been testing, I haven't really been testing catalog search. We have, we have an issue with updating uh, authority records, um, particularly when you have someone, I don't know, what, one example I'm working with is Jackie Chan. There's 150 some FIB records associated with his authority. And when they update that, it's got to go through and update all those 156 FIB records. And depending on what's going on and what's in cache, that can take six minutes, which is just way too long. It's because it's basically ingesting all the FIBs again. Um, so on, on, but on PG-12, that, that finished in like, you know, less than a minute. I think it was, I think it was, I, well, I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head now, actually, but it was a lot faster. Wow. Like it, was so, it was so fast, I had to go in and double check that everything actually happened, because I thought maybe it just blew up, you know, on 12, but it didn't. It, it finished. So. Wow. It was that to look forward to. 
Yeah, that's a good what's problem to have? <laughs> what's this? What's the state of twelve and compatibility with Evergreen? I think it's as compatible as ten. So if you fix the three or the handful of functions that need to be fixed, and maybe one or two of the storage queries, I forget now. Um, then so basically, I think if you install the latest three four or three five, you should be good to go. Yeah, because we're well, looking at we're looking at updating the three four, and that was updating the our development servers to Postgres twelve. I had several other things in the meantime because um, I was upgrading them to Postgres twelve. I, mean, I haven't been able to set up any of the queries yet, but that's good to know that hey, it'll speed up the searching because that's one of the biggest complaints that we have. So you're saying um, I'm on three three four two, I think. Um, so you're saying if I upgrade a, I'm ready to upgrade to Postgres 12, and if I do, everybody's going to love me? I, I, would, I, would, I would caution, go ahead, Jason, I think you're going to I was going to say I wouldn't do that in production right away. Um, well, yeah. I, I can't guarantee that everything works. The things I've looked, like I've deliberately looked at the things that broke with 10 after applying the fixes, and they still, they still work with 12. I've looked at a few other things that we haven't looked at. Uh, or that weren't broken with 10 and everything I've looked at so far has worked, but I haven't actually like really stress tested a system on 12. So, but yeah, from what I can see, it's 11 is where you like, so 10 is a little bit faster than 9.6. 11 is a lot faster than 9.6. And then 12 is a, is a little bit faster than 11 from what I've been able to see. Um, I, I was going to say that uh, other significant factors in just database speed in general are the hardware it's running on and whether or not it's um, configured correctly, optimized for the hardware that it's running on. So there, there are uh, post, Postgres configuration is kind of a combination of art and science. I'm sort of paraphrasing something Mike Arlander said to me once. Um, and you you have to learn what those are. There's not there there are there is documentation out there. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of research, other than just reading the docs, to really understand what each section does and uh, we, what each setting does. And it's very much um, you have to experiment, which nobody wants to do in production. But you know that's kind of the only place because that's what you're trying to fix. So you know you might tweak tweak things, but things like, you know, memory allowed and, you know, what sort of storage it's running on and, you know, how fast the processor is, all of that's going to be a huge factor in, in speed. Is, is, I want to add that in my case, this is all the same hardware because I have the four versions running simultaneously on different ports on the same machine. I use the same, I, I just basically uh, PG restore the production data. Um, so it's, product, it's our production data, same hardware. Uh, 10, 11, and 12 are all running on default configuration. And the 9.6 has been optimized, but not to use the full hardware. It's been optimized partially. So, and the hardware itself isn't like, it's not equal to our production server. It's, it doesn't have enough RAM to hold the whole database at once. It has tons of disk space, though. It's got like eight terabytes of space. Um, but the RAM's not the best. So, but I, I do see improvements with going from, you know, 9.6 to 12, definitely. What's the highest version of Postgres that we know of in the wild on production for any evergreen system? We're on 9.6. We, we moved, I actually upgraded us one night. <laughs> I guess this was uh, in advance of our, this was December, it was right before our, our, our upgrade to 3.4. And because I did not, it wasn't clear to me that I needed to just change a few, few uh, functions that were breaking. I just saw tons and tons of errors. So I had to spend like, you know, a couple more hours up, re-upgrading to 9.6. It was very not fun. Um, but so I, I think I went to 11, which is a fun thing to be able to say. Um, but yeah, it was, 
that was that was it. I went to eleven, and then I saw your email or sh you you regaled that experience on IRC, I believe. Yeah, and, and I, was, uh, I was a little embarrassed after. <laughs> well, after learning, there's a bug for that. So. <laughs> uh so to, to anybody's knowledge nine six is the highest anybody's got in production That's i think so yeah got here <clears throat> to yeah. clear yeah i've only touched 12 on the community demo server which is not exactly high stress so mm -hmm. yeah i'm running 10 on, on my personal test server again it's just like a very low low uh low provision box it's not not anything to judge load on. Also, are these um, fixes to those functions a part of the upgrade scripts automatically whenever you go to some version or if you pass the right flag to the make or whatever? They, if, you, if you upgrade past the version where they were added, you have them. They're in the upgrade scripts. Um, yeah. We made sure that the fixes still worked on 9.6 and didn't cause any performance degradation on 9.6 either. Right. Um, so yeah, so that was three four plus, I believe, and and I was still on three two, and that's why it broke. If I had upgraded Evergreen and then upgraded the database, I would not have seen any problems. Probably. Okay. So rule of thumb there is to upgrade Evergreen to three four or newer first. Mm -hmm. Yes. For yeah. Or 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 backport those patches. I mean, it's it, yeah, it, you it's can not, backport. It's just changing a couple of function calls. And everybody's gun shy now. Nobody wants to go to 10 first. Actually, I, I am my plan over uh, Labor Day weekend because we leave the libraries alone all summer um, is to move to a newer version of Postgres. I, I, I originally thought 10, but I'm now thinking maybe a little newer. We're, we're talking about it, I, uh, about going to 12. Um, maybe, it, but that depends on having enough time to basically test it all. You cut out there, Chris. Did oh. you say? Did you say you wanted to go to ten or nine eight? What'd you say? That that was Jason. No, no, it was you. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I I um I was saying I wanted to go to. Um, I, I'll probably go to something newer than ten. I, you know, I, I guess that's where I was being somewhat conservative when I chose ten, and that was back in December. And um, you know. I don't mind being somewhat pioneering uh, in that. So, you know, probably 11 or 12. Uh, this okay. This will be in September, you know, or end of August. And, uh, well, I'm definitely excited about this subject. Has anybody got any um, stress testing type uh, scripts or anything so we could do it on a dev server and then hit it really hard? I, I wrote a, I, I have one Perl script that hits a server and goes and looks up a bunch of words from a, uh, an open API online and then feeds those words into the search engine in parallel like 10 at a time and and then measures um, you know how long each one took to come back and that's interfacing with the database directly and also through the OPAC so it can both stress Postgres for directly with Postgres queries or through the load balancer and through your application stack. Um, anybody else got something like that? You know the only thing we do is um, we haven't done it lately because I've been using the PG upgrade feature that just is so good. But when we were doing PG dump, PG restore, if you do PG restore with like, you know, three quarters of your uh, uh, processor core number, that's a pretty dang good test. So like you've got a, you've got a box with, you know, 24 cores hitting it with 18 or something like that at a time like if it doesn't fall over that's probably a good test of just you know can it work but no i i like since i guess bill had that constrictor thing years ago but like i don't think we've seen any that i've seen anyway um scripts that pound a server that i'm aware of that are out there it's pretty easy if you're if, if you're mainly worried about searching, then you know writing a Perl script to just do gateway calls is pretty pretty straightforward, and you can kick off ten of them or whatever. Um, and then there's also things like PG Bench, which I've never personally used, but I know it's out there. 
You could just get a cat to sit on the enter key. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been used I one of the, the way I determined that uh, PG 12 and 11 and 10 were faster than 96 I used something called PL profiler um, it's on github you have to install it from source but you you basically install it you create the you have to build the extension for the database you create the extension in the database you want to test on then you can run a query with PL profiler and it will go through and it will tell you which parts of it are slow. And so in the case of, say, update and authority record, it went through and it said, oh, it's spending all of its time doing um, meta bib re ingest attributes on the bib records that are linked. You know, so that's how I knew where the slowness was and then where I knew where the speed ups were uh, for going through uh, Postgres 12. That's awesome. PL profiler. PL profiler. <clears throat> I'll post my thing, but it's a couple of years old now. Well, anything would be handy. I, I've often wanted to write something to stress test the server, you know, and I haven't really gotten around to it because there's so many other things to do. Yeah, I want to yeah. add. Go ahead. I just wanted to add too that I also upgraded the operating system on the post this Postgres server to Ubuntu 20. And doing that made a difference too. That's interesting. Yeah, the new kernel is faster than the older one. It looks like. Is it like a four point something to five point something, or still in uh, the going? Range? Yeah, going from six. So sixteen is four. Well, it's unless you install the hardware. Oh, the uh, HWE. Yeah, unless you do the hardware with HWE, whatever that stands for. Unless you install that kernel, you're going from basically going from 4.4 to 5.4, I think, oh. going from 16 to 20. Um, okay. But and to get there, you've GitHub? got to go from 16 to 18 to 20. Did you put it in GitHub to make it faster, Jason? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Call back. Yeah, if you host, only if you host your branch there, right? Right. Well, Microsoft loves Linux these days. <laughs> That's true. They still don't have much love for Teams users. Seems like a problem you brought upon yourself. Oh, well, <laughs> it, 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 uh, when it when it came with the suite, it's uh, you know trying yeah, times economically. Why aren't we holding the conference on Teams? There you go. Let's let's switch over now. I so know, let's do not. No. On, on, that, on that note, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call the session to a close unless there are some uh, uh, final lingering questions or comments. Any particular reasons for going with the Ubuntu as the platform other than others? I, that I, I'll I'll answer that one. Um, Originally, um, originally, I think it was meant to be on uh, Gen 2 or something crazy, but they went with Debian, the original devs, and, and Bill, Bill can correct me if I'm wrong, but they went with Debian, um, and um, several of us in the community around 2013 or so started moving into Ubuntu platforms, and that's... Um, at GPLS, that was our preferred platform for other things going on. So we decided to standardize everything and move it all to Ubuntu LTS. And so that's where it lives. Um, on that note, I actually have a couple of, of uh, branches that, I'm, that I've been working on casually over the last few years to um, increase support for CentOS and um, Red Hat, uh, which I, I've gotten open surf running on both, but I'm, I'm still fighting with dependency problems uh, and uh, C libraries for whatever reason on uh, on Red Hat and CentOS for Evergreen. So um, I, I would love for that not to be a requirement that you run Ubuntu because you know there are lots of CentOS shops or Red Hat shops that would just say nope if, if Evergreen had to run on something they're not used to running. So. Um, that's a great that's, question. That's what Docker's yeah, for. That too. <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, 
Debian pretty much across the board. We have some Ubuntu stuff here and there, but Evergreen's all on uh, Debian. Right. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today. And um, I guess this is the last session of the conference. We, we won't sing old Lang Syne or anything, mm -hmm. but just uh, <laughs> I hope y'all take care and um, you know, we'll see you on IRC and email lists. And you know, I mean, there's nothing stopping us from doing Zoom calls and stuff like that uh, along the way. So uh, just keep in touch and good luck and always pass some uh, questions to us if you need them. Bye, everyone. All right. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Well, Bye. Thank you to NC Cardinal for hosting and, and Absolutely. Uh, babysitting us as we uh, stumble through uh, <laughs> Zoom and all that stuff. So Yeah, thanks. we'll see you at the same uh, bat time, same bat channel. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.